Hey everyone, last Sunday we had some technical difficulties that prevented us from streaming the worship service. Unfortunately, the recording that we did of it didn't turn out very well. So I'm going to share with you what I shared with our congregation that was here Sunday morning. And I hope this will be an encouragement to you. We're starting a brand new series right now, and so I want you to be a part of it as we get things underway. We're going to be uh, studying out of the book of Ezra. Now, the book of Ezra may not be well known to everyone, so let me give you a little background as we get started so that you can catch up and know what we're doing. Uh, In the book of Ezra, it starts with the nation of Israel in captivity. You see, in 605 B.C., the Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar took Israel into captivity, removed them from their home, destroyed and decimated the city and the temple, and kept them as prisoners. After a while, uh, in, in 539 B.C., Cyrus, under the Assyrian Empire, came and crushed the Babylonians and took over the leadership of the area. So now Israel finds themselves still in captivity, yet under another captor. Israel remains in captivity for some 70 years. And it would be during this time of their next captor, Cyrus, that they would finally be permitted to return back to Israel to rebuild their city and their homes and their lives and the temple of God. Now, Ezra writes this. Now, Ezra was a scribe and also a priest. And some interesting facts about the book of Ezra. Originally, the book of Ezra was one scroll that contained both what we would call Ezra and Nehemiah. It was all one book. But then around medieval times, it it was separated out. Traditionally, it was called 1st Ezra, 2nd Ezra, but then eventually it became commonly known as we know it today, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, but they were both once at one time. Another interesting aspect about the book is that it was written partially in Aramaic and partially in Hebrew. And this goes to the fact that they were, Israel was in captivity, and as in captivity, they began to lose some of their identity. They began to lose some of their distinctiveness as a person, as a nation, as the um, nation that captured them began to make inroads into both their personal lives, into their culture. And what Israel was facing at this time of captivity was kind of a sort of like a quarantine just like we've been experiencing, but obviously much more harsh. They could not return to their homeland. They could not uh, do the things that they normally would be accustomed to doing. Uh, They could not um, perform the offices of the priest as far as sacrifices and do many of the holidays like they had been accustomed to. And so there was a lot of things that were restrictive to them. It kind of bears a resemblance to our situation. Again, we're not in captivity like that. We're not being persecuted to that extent at all. Uh, But these past four months have restricted what we can do. Now, Now, here are my thoughts, and kind of follow along if you would. Seventy years ago, when Israel was taken into captivity, prior to their captivity, the prophet Jeremiah urged them to go ahead and surrender to the nation, that it was inevitable for their captivity. If they would do that, uh, Nebuchadnezzar would spare the city and the temple destruction. But the people would not listen to Jeremiah. They rebelled, they resisted, and so Nebuchadnezzar came in with a heavy hand, took them into captivity, and destroyed and decimated the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Now, 70 years later, They are given an opportunity, if you would, to now go and um, rebuild. And and what I want to do as we go through this book is I'd like us to examine some of the principles that Nehemiah put into practice that help their nation rebuild. We're going to be facing a time of rebuilding as we're able to come back to church. And, yeah, we have some setbacks, and we'll be talking about those things. But we want to rebuild our ministry. We want to do what God has called us to do. And I believe there's some principles here that we can uh, learn from. So if you have your scriptures, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 1. If you don't know where Ezra is, if you go in the Old Testament and you begin to find the books of 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 
uh, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. Ezra comes right after those books. And we're going to begin in chapter 1, but we're going to cover uh, the high points from chapters 1 through 3. Now, we won't have time to um, read everything in those three chapters, so let me encourage you later to take some time and actually read through the whole content of those chapters. It won't take you long, and it'll give you some valuable insight that we won't have time to go through all this morning. So, let's begin. Ezra chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Here's what it says. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, here's what I want you to see. I want you to notice how this movement began. There's a movement that's taking place here. Um, Ezra's involved, uh, Cyrus is involved, Jeremiah is involved, uh, Zerubbabel's going to be involved, and there are going to be a host of other people that are coming to this equation. But what I want you to understand is they are not the initiators. They didn't begin the movement. They didn't start things. There was someone else that actually started this whole movement that's taking place here. And I don't want you to miss it. Here's our, our first thought, the thought I want to give you. God is at work. See, behind the scenes, God was busy. He was working. He was moving. He was fulfilling his plan. And even though on the surface it may not look like he was doing anything, God was busy and he was working and he was moving. Now, right now, as we are in the midst of the uh, COVID crisis, I want you to understand that God is at work. God hasn't taken a vacation. He hasn't left us. He hasn't forgotten us. God is working. And often we perceive that God is absent or disinterested or passive, but he's not. He is absolutely not. And so sadly, many, because of um, the, they're focused on the wrong thing. Sometimes we're focused on the virus or we're focused on the media or we're focused on politics or maybe we're just focused on complaining we miss what God is doing. And, and here's what I want you to, to realize. I don't want you to miss what God is doing at this moment because he's working. In the midst of this crisis, God is at work moving in ways that maybe you're not perceiving it because you're not looking for it. I want you to notice in our passage here that, that, that God is moving in the lives of his people. He's beginning to, to move the hearts of his people. Now, Jeremiah, 70 years prior, had foretold about this movement. And God always keeps his word. God always keeps his promises. And he's working passionately in the hearts of those of the people of God. But I want you to also notice that God is working in the heart of unbelievers here. He is working in the heart of King Cyrus. Now, Cyrus was not a believer. He was a pagan king. And yet, he ruled over God's people. So let me ask you as we think about this, does God work in the lives of unbelievers? Does God deal with the hearts of unbelieving people or does he just ignore them? No, God absolutely works in the lives of unbelievers. And in verse 1 that we just read, we saw where God specifically said that he stirred the heart of Cyrus the king. God is moving. And I don't want us to miss what God is doing as he begins to work in our hearts and in the hearts of others during this critical time. Let's look together at verses 2 and 3. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among of all his people? His God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Now, God is going to use a pagan king to facilitate his people returning to the land. As they return to the land, they're going to rebuild the city, and they're going to rebuild their homes, and they're going to rebuild the temple. But even uh, in addition to that, they're going to rebuild their lives. And God is using this, this guy that doesn't even believe in God to help them to do that. 
Now, how can God do it? Because he is God. So there are two things, two vital things I want us to, to glean from this before we move on. They're, they are so, so important. The first thing here is this. God is not limited by who is ruling the nation. He's not. I know we're in a political year and our minds are, t- are attuned to politics and elections. And I believe that as we have opportunity to voice our opinion and to, to share our thoughts, that we should exercise that. Absolutely. We should pray and seek to have good leadership and good uh, people in office. We, we should do that. And yet, Regardless of who's in office, God can change the heart. God can take a heart of even a pagan like Cyrus, and he can move him to do his will. So God's not limited by who rules the nation. And the second thing that we see here is God is not limited by the condition of the nation. See, Israel's in captivity. They're in bondage. They don't have the freedom to do certain things. They don't have the resources. And yet God is going to going to work through and in that situation to bring about his will. So even when circumstances seem to be restrictive, God is not limited by those things. It's just an opportunity for God to work in an amazing way. So the question comes to mind, how is God going to accomplish this task? And to make it more personal, how are we going to accomplish the task in our situation? Well, here, here's what I want us to know as we go forward. What always precedes how? What always precedes how? That is, you will know in your heart uh, what, what God wants you to do. You will know the what in your heart that God wants you to do before you know the how He intends to bring it about. See, we, want, we always are enamored with God, how we're going to do it. And God says, I, don't, I can handle that. What I want you to do is is get focused on the what and this is what i want you to do this is what i'm going to do and and god is going to do something that nobody expected nobody thought that god would use a pagan king to facilitate his work but god's going to do that god had the how all worked out ezra knew the what now but the question really at this point is who who needed to be answered and the answer to that is simply this, and that takes us to, to our, our second thought that I want you to really glean, is this. God wants to include you in his work. God wants to include you in your work. Just kind of take your finger and tap your chest and say, that's who God wants to include in here. Now you say, well, wait a minute, time out. Didn't you just say in the beginning that God was at work and God's working and God's moving? Absolutely. But understand this, that the way that God works is he works through people. God doesn't work independently of people most times. And we like, we want that. We kind of say, all right, God, you're going to do this work. Just kind of drop it down from heaven, you know, bring it down to us. And and God says, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it out of you. I'm going to use you. He works through people. He works through you. If we aren't willing then we're not going to see the work of God take place as he desires to do. So what God is going to do is he's going to use the resources of Cyrus and even his people to accomplish this monumental task. I want you to skip down to chapter 2 now in verse 68, and here's what it says. And some of the chief of the fathers, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is at Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God, to set it up in his place. Now, this chapter gives a list of all these different people and names that, 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 that came down and became a part of this. And if you kind of add all those things up, there was about 50,000 Jews that returned. They were basically a remnant of the people. It was not the majority of the nation that came. Most people didn't respond, never came back. So this small amount of people come back to do the work. Now, one thing I find interesting is that there is no comment about their journey to Jerusalem. Now, from where they are to Jerusalem is a 900-mile trip. And can you imagine what happened during that trip? Have you ever taken a trip with your family? Sure you have. And there's always something that happens. You miss your exit. um, Kids misbehave. 
uh, you, you get a flat tire, um, you get stuck in a traffic jam. I mean, there's always something there, comment about the trips, particularly if it's a long trip. Okay, and uh, he, he doesn't say anything a, a, about that. So I just thought that was interesting. But the focal point now is going to be on the who, and that is that God wants to enlist them into his work. And so here's the question I want you to ponder as we move forward. How is this who going to do the what? How will this who do the what? Okay, we, we have identified the, the who is, is Israel and Cyrus. We've identified the what is going back and rebuilding. But how are they going to do that? Let me just tell you, this is not a problem for God. The only problem, if God has a problem, is us. He has no problem doing anything. We are his only problem, if, if we can say that. Now, Cyrus is going to cooperate. He's going to send back with Israel much of the temple items that Nehemiah took when he overthrew the city. And this is good news for them because there wasn't a, a temple supply store nearby. I mean, it wasn't, you know, go to the neighborhood temple supply store, say, yeah, we need a Ark of the Covenant. We need a table of showbread. Uh, how, how many of these menorahs do you have? Can you spare? They, they didn't have any of those. And so it was good that Solomon, uh, that, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar kept those things, and they were able to bring them back as part of the restoration. But, but Cyrus wasn't the only person that was going to contribute to this. They gave. We saw in verse 68 that, the, that the, those that returned f offered freely. They gave of the resources. You said they're, 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 they're you know, were captives. They didn't have much. That's right. But God took what they had and used it in an incredible way incredible way. God made this possible, but he used the efforts of people. Everybody has a part to play. God does not um, sit back and, um, and do all the work for us. And the fact that God is working, it does not imply that we are to be passive in the process. God wants to use you to accomplish his work. And as we, as, as a congregation, start to rebuild, God wants to use you as well in this process. That means God wants you to be busy in, in, in serving. We need you to serve. We need you to give. We need you to, to pray. We need you to witness. We need you to participate in what we're doing. We need you to stay connected with one another. And that's not all. There's one final component that I want you to, not to miss as we go into chapter 3. And it's that God wants us to work in unity. The work of God is not about everybody doing their own thing. It's not about whatever you like to do, you do it, and you do it independently of other people, or you've got this idea and everybody's got to follow your idea. No, we work together for the glory of God. Chapter 3, verse 1 says this. And when the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together, and I watch this expression, as one man to Jerusalem. These people are working in conjunction with one another. They are working in unity. Uh, they are working as one man. But unity always requires some adjustment. It's a give and take on both sides. And we see that in the following verses. So skip down if you would, and we're going to look at verses 12 and 13. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice. And many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. When Solomon built the original temple, it was absolutely magnificent. There had never been a temple like that before. It was just stunning. The quality, the, the embellishments of it were the finest that anyone could imagine. And so as these folks are trying to rebuild, the temple that they're going to construct is not going to be the same as Solomon's temple. 
It's not going to look the, quite the same. It's not going to be at the same level. And so those of the older people that, that remembered that, they could go back and they remembered seeing the temple and how it was set up and everything. They began to become very nostalgic. And now they're like, oh, woe is me. We're, this is how it's supposed to be. This is the great temple. And now they're weeping and now they're sad and now they're disappointed because the temple isn't going to be at that level. And yet the others that, that did not have that experience, a different generation, they were just glad because they had never had a temple at all. And so to have this temple was, was, was obviously of great joy to them as opposed to not having any temple at all. Now, as we rebuild, I want you to get this because this is very important. As we rebuild, we must keep in mind that the future will be very different than the past. The future is going to be different than the past. And, and that's how it is. Don't cry and weep because the future is not like the past. It's the future. Be in a jovial state. Be, be glad that God is still at work. Here's what I want you to remember too. That as things are changing, as we rebuild... I'm going to tell you, some things are going to be like they were, and some things are going to change. And some things will change for a while, and some things may never be the same. If you can kind of think back to uh, what happened here in this country on 9-11 and all the changes that took place in air travel, we, we kind of look at those screening processes and stuff as normal now. But prior to 9-11, those things didn't exist. But now they are part of our life. And I suspect when we get past this COVID virus, there are going to be some things that change and it'll be a new um, way of doing those things. But don't forget, God is the same. He's never, he hasn't changed. He's not a different God. And we've got to focus on Him. Focus on Him. See, generations will always be different, but we must work in unity to accomplish the work of God. So, as we think about all that we've talked about and those things, I want to I want to kind of end with this statement that really just just captures everything these first 3 chapters have have stated, and it's simply this, what God originates, God orchestrates. See, God originated this. God started this. It wasn't Cyrus or the people. God started this. So, whatever God originates, okay, he orchestrates. He's got this. He, he knows what he's doing. So the question is, what, what, what should we do? What is our response as we think about this? There's so much to do, but, but how do we do it? And so I want you to consider these issues. First of all, the what, okay, the what. The what is our mission, We've been given a mission from God, the Great Commission. We are to, to reach people with the gospel. Okay? We are to make sure that people come to life in Christ. And that mission hasn't changed. The fact that we are dealing with COVID, where the fact that we're in a political time, the fact that we have some restrictions, in no way impacts the command that God has given to us to make disciples of all people. That's the what. Don't lose sight of that. Don't get so enamored with what we can't do and, 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 and what we can, where we can't go that you forget that we are still called to reach people with the gospel. The second is the who. So who's supposed to do this? Well, may I be honest? It's you. It's me. God wants to use you in this process. You're not, you don't get a pass because you're not a pastor. You don't get a pass because you're at home. None of us do. God wants to use us, and we need to keep on moving for the glory of God. The what, the who, and now the how. The how. How do we do this? Well, let me tell you, God is already working. And so I want to encourage you to seek the movement of God. I want you to begin to look around, and I want you to see where it is that God is moving, God is working. See, we don't have to really invent that. We just have to be aware of where God's working, and then join God 
We need to start looking for the opportunities. And listen, if you're not looking for the opportunities, I promise you won't see them. You won't notice them. You'll go away where well, there aren't any opportunities. And yes, they are. We're just not looking for them. If you look for them, God will reveal them. Because as we've seen through this message, what God originates, God orchestrates. Now, my friends, the day that man sinned, God set into motion his plan. He didn't sit around waiting. He began to move in the lives of people and in the world, his plan. And throughout history, we can see that God, that God was moving. And God kept moving. And one day he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, who lived and died and rose again, that we might be saved. He did everything to save me, to save you. Friend, your works and your religion won't cut it. It won't save you, but only Jesus can. So the what? We're all sinners. We've broken God's law. We've all sinned. We've all messed up. The who is Jesus. Jesus paid our sin debt, and he offers forgiveness to those who are willing to accept his offering. And the how is simply this, turn from your sin and trust the Savior. Come to him, call upon his name, and he will save you. Friend, if we can be a help in that process, if you have questions, if you'd like someone to help you in knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior, please reach out to us. Give us a call, contact us on our website. We'd be happy to take the time and personally help you to know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. If you're a believer, then I want to challenge you to begin to look for the opportunities to share Christ with people during this time. I know that there's restrictions. I know that there are limitations. But let me tell you, there are opportunities that are out there if we look for them, if we look for where God is moving. Let me pray as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to share this message. And I hope that it's touched someone's heart, that as we think about rebuilding our church, that we begin to look at these principles that you have infused into this book of Ezra. And Lord, as we begin to kind of lift them out and we begin to put them in the practice, may you help us to rebuild the ministry that you have called us to. And Lord, beyond that, I pray that you'd rebuild the lives of people that are listening here that need you as Savior. Lord, they, they have gone astray. They, they have trusted in, in things like their good works or their rituals that, that just cannot sustain them, but Jesus can. So Lord, I pray that you would rebuild their lives. Thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer, and thank you for what you're going to do. Now, please take this message, use it, and bless it for your kingdom's advancement. And I want to thank you in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being a part of this uh, message today. I hope that it encouraged your heart. And please tune in next time as we continue to preach the Word of God. Thank you.